thank you very much for inviting me um, for this talk on, on biology and resistance, um, which I ought to accomplish in 15 minutes, uh, and uh, that's quite a task, actually. So I kind of focus on certain things which I think are important. So you've seen that slide probably over and over again within the past couple of years or so, and um, basically what we see in the clinic quite often is that you expose a, a patient to a given drug and there will be response, and over time it just evades responsiveness and becomes resistance. Um, and the, there's the other clinical scenario, which is um, the lower one, where you do not have response at all, whatever you do, the tumor just keeps on growing. And um, kind of question, I mean, how do you assess that? I mean, what is intrinsic, res uh, intrinsic resistance? Is that something that, I mean, it's quite clear if it's progressive disease, it's intrinsic resistance, but how do you measure? Is it three months time, within six months time? And um, I would even propose it c can be done differently, and that's something we have shown for uh, ESMO and a quite uh, different um, aspect, and I, I would just draw your attention to tumor shrinkage um, in different categories and to the orange and red line um, in patients that have been is exposed to tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And uh, I would argue if there is no tumor shrinkage, I mean, these are the ones that are truly non-responsive and uh, intrinsic resistant. So there's some work that looked into the tumor architecture, and I think that really um, gets us um, to a point where uh, you've heard a lot during the day about microenvironment, and I think that's a, a, um, uh, another way to look at this, because there, there seems to be some correlation in terms of how the tumor has been built up. Um, so whatever is blue on here are tumor nests, and um, you can see that there, there's a resistant uh, phenotype for VGF inhibition, um, where the tumor nests are blue, and the vessels, which are green, um, are surrounding these tumor nests. And this is the resistant phenotype and the sensitive phenotype, it's mixed up. So the vessels are inside the tumor, basically. And that has been um, investigated in, um, in uh, preclinical models and also in, in um, um, patient specimens, actually. So even though I think it may not be the solution for RCC, it really takes us to the re level of microenvironment, which has been a topic um, during the day, and I think is, is really the next step um, where um, you could just um, get to the next point of, of therapy. And um, this is a rather complex scenario, and uh, I think myeloid cells have been mentioned quite often um, today, and, and it really is a, um, a mechanism of how to sustain angiogenesis in this, in this uh, complex. So um, macrophages are part of that, and um, the M2 and macrophages have been explored in terms of how they influence um, tumor growth, and this is a nice model um, where um, tumor cells have been inoculated in mice, and either with or without uh, macrophages, so this is the one, only the tumor cells, and here tumor cells plus mac micro, uh, macrophages, and you see that there is an increase in tumor growth once you inoculate these two uh, compartments, and um, there's also an increase in angiogenesis, so really supporting the notion that macrophages do spur tumor growth um, and are important um, in that scenario. In, on, on top of that, I mean, if you, if you talk about microenvironment and stroma, um, of course there's fibroblasts, and um, th there are uh, numerous articles addressing this issue, I think, in terms of um, supporting angiogenesis, and I just um, brought you this one, which is about autophagy, um, a, um, an area that becomes more and more apparent in, in treatment of cancer, um, where the autophagy of fibroblasts really is spurring or fueling um, the cancer cell with, with ketones and lactates to really um, um, spur growth. And um, it can be done, or well, LKB1 is, in, is a molecule that um, could manage um, fibroblast autophagy, and has been in, interestingly studied here in this model, where uh, kinase that LKB1 um, has been shown to decrease autophagy and therefore lead to delayed tumor growth um, in this model. So um, in acquired resistance, we do have a little bit different scenario where we do have an um, initial response to a TKI and then it's being um, um, resistant. 
and that has been explored here in this um, study that uh, you probably know it's from 2011 and in that scenario xenotransplant have been then at time of resistance transferred to another host and then re-exposed to the very same drug which is uh, serafinib in that case and it responded again and the gene signature that came along with resistance was reverted so that really gives you an idea that some of these um, resistant mechanisms may be transient at least and uh, it, it goes along very well with the clinical data that we have. So um, uh, you've heard about third-line therapy. Is it effective? Yes, it is. But in, in terms of efficacy, you will lose efficacy over time if you go from first to third line. So um, apparently there's more than just this reversible type of, of resistance, um, but there must be also other factors that uh, kick in later, in later lines of therapy. And. Um, I think something we have to keep in mind, and that could be one of the hurdles that we have seen with some of the current aspects in clinical trials, is really, I mean, what, what are we measuring? And um, if, if you look for serum, and um, you can measure tons of cytokines that go up and down with um, different treatments, and um, is it really what you see is what you get here? Is, this an, is it the key driver that we measure in the bloodstream? It is unlikely to be the case, actually. And um, th that is an example from um, a lung carcinoma, um, preoperative exposure to um, uh, pazoponib in that scenario for only a brief period of time. So this wasn't intended to look for remission, but rather than go for uh, um, biomarkers. And what you see, it's, it's almost exclusive upregulation of PLGF uh, throughout the course. And this is, this is unlikely to be related to resistance. Um, it's just um, a biological response to the VGF receptor inhibition. So for a while it has been thought that PLGF could overcome um, angiogenesis inhibition, and uh, it has been debated, um, but eventually it, it becomes clear that PLGF is not the major driver of, of uh, resistance to angiogenesis, uh, angiogenic genetic inhibitors. Um, and so therefore that, that is one of the caveats that we face when, once we measure just a certain um, biomarker. And there's also more to that, and um, there's again a preclinical model looking into um, resistance to um, VGFR2 inhibition, which has been done here um, with an antibody. And at time of, of tumor resistance, it has been analyzed for certain um, cytokines. And uh, it, it appears that FGF and angiopoietin uh, could, could be major drivers um, in resistance to VGF inhibition. Um, and as you know, the angiopoietin study um, um, in combination with serafinib has been negative, and um, you just have seen the davidinib data, which I also have for you here. And it looks apparently that the expansion of, of the TKI um, spectrum by addition of the FGF receptor does not really do the trick that we would like it to do, actually. Um, so it's more complex than just looking at one simple parameter and then embarking on that with a, a, a medical therapy and just um, having the tremendous benefit. So I think in, in the last part of my talk, I would just talk briefly about enrichment design or um, how we could succeed in that scenario. And uh, for that purpose, I chose um, um, a melanoma model with kid mutant melanomas which certainly is just a small subgroup in that scenario. And um, it's about 5% that will harbor um, activating mutations in the KIT gene. Um, but however, once you treat those with imatinib, it, it has tremendous effect. Um, the uh, response rate is about 40% in these patients. And I think what is nice about this um, publication is they looked into um, tumors at the time of disease progression. And of course, this is melanoma, and this is more simple to get tumor biopsies done um, than in, in renal cell carcinoma. But anyhow, that's what they did um, in some index patients. There were only a few of them. And interestingly, they didn't find any secondary mutations that could drive the tumor that, uh, as a process of selection throughout the course of treatment with imatinib. But instead, they find some activity in the AKT mTOR pathway. And therefore, uh, they embarked on a second-line treatment with um, Averolimus as an mTOR inhibitor, and again had major response. 
um, in these tumors. And I, I think this is really illustrates nicely how we really should do our clinical trials. And uh, there's no way we're going to succeed in later lines of therapy without having that tissue done at time of progression and knowing what's, what's happening in the tumor or the stroma. Um, uh, in, and instead of on focusing of serum marker, I think this is really where uh, we should go for. So does this translate somehow into RCC? Well, yes, it does. Um, there are some um, articles relating to M2 activity and, and poor outcome in renal cell carcinoma, um, and this is uh, one of them. So as you've seen here, so phosphorylation of m is associated with a poor prognosis in, this, in these patients, and um, that's something that would kind of translate to the data that you have seen already. So, I mean, Everolimus is not an option for first line. That's clear. I mean, we don't do that. It's not supported by these trials that we do. But however, in later lines of therapy, um, as you, based on what you've seen uh, in the melanoma setting, I mean, it, it could be that we, we do have a priming um, effect by uh, using the VEGF inhibitors um, initially, inducing hypoxia in these tumors and altering them, and therefore mTOR may play a better role in later lines of therapy than initially. So with that, I would like to conclude. Um, certainly, VEGF resistance is uh, beyond the scope of a single driver mutations, and uh, the microenvironment really adds another complexity, layer of complexity to this scenario. But however, this is where we really should aim for. And I think selecting the right target population is really key for our clinical trials to succeed um, and to have positive trials. Thank you.